You're listening to The Crypt and this week's very special guest is one of the best known final girls in a horror movie and that is Adrian King who played Alice in the very first Friday the 13th. So thanks so much for joining me today, Adrian. It's my pleasure, Rita. Well, so firstly, can we talk about how the role of Alice came about for you? Well, we have to go way, way, way back (laughs) before probably most of your listeners were born in the year 1979. And uh, 1979 in New York City, I was uh, a young actress uh, with only a commercial agent, not even a theatrical agent. So there was a an advertisement in backstage for an open call Mm -hmm. and all actors uh, and actresses between the ages of like 16 and 26 um, were, uh, you know, uh, camp counselors. It it was camp counselors and there was no name of the movie at that point, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I showed up and there were already like 300, 400 people already on the, on the list. And, you know, you wow. just do what you have to do as a, an actress and you wait and you go in. Well, obviously, I had the right look, so I got a call back. And then um, uh, they had me read and I got another call back. It was one. It, it was during the summer and it took a, it was a process of probably about six weeks. And then they started um, the casting directors, Barry Marks and Hugh, uh, Julie Hughes, um, were New York at the best of casting directors and they had all their good actors together and they paired us and read with different people. And so I got to the screen test part because they didn't know who was going to play who at the time. Yeah. So, um, so there was uh, a bunch of us and uh, maybe five girls that they had towards the end for a screen test. And Sean Cunningham uh, called me later that afternoon and told me I nailed it. So, uh, Fantastic. That was how it. It was a long stretch, though. It was a long, uh, uh, at least, uh, at least six weeks of auditions and pairings and all that kind of thing. And then we started filming uh, the day after Labor Day in this country, which is like the last weekend of the summer, at a Boy Scout camp. Uh, as soon as the Boy Scouts left, we moved in. So even though it was a, cam- a movie about summer camp, we started filming. At the end of the summer, yeah. you know. So that's how uh, Alice was, uh, that's how she came about or um, Adrian became Alice. <laughs> and then, of course, you didn't have a full script either at the start. Victor was still kind of right when uh, she went along. Yeah, we, we had a very thin script as I liked, you know. It yeah. was um, some different scenes all kind of put together and then... Uh, that strip monopoly scene was added as we went in, and then the final scene was added after a bit. And uh, it was truly an independent uh, passion film, you know, super low budget, especially uh, for uh, for the screen value uh it was incredible what they got out of the money and uh no stunt people very very limited budget so that i only have one change of clothes <laughs> i went and had to buy my own cowboy boots because the boots they had for me were a half a size too small and they wanted me to stretch them out and my poor feet were like no <laughs> wow. so i went and in, uh, in, <laughs> i went and got my own cowboy boots uh That I have till this very day with all my jewelry because uh, we were so low budget, Rita, that um, I would save the continuity Polaroids and all the bits and pieces that were thrown away. As an artist, I figured if this never was finished, um, even though I, you know, everybody was keeping their fingers crossed, I figured I'd make a fabulous collage <laughs> to remind me of uh, of the experience but needless to say I never had to do that and so all those that wonderful uh, all those wonderful things went into a box with my boots and my jewelry and the Polaroids and my script and was taped up for 25 years and collected dust until oh uh, we retired ha 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 retired to mm-hmm. southern Oregon I, I laugh because I've never been busier in my life <laughs> <laughs> And isn't it crazy to think such a low budget movie to become the franchise it has become? I bet you're so glad you kept all those things now because so many people don't. 
thinking the movie oh, won't go anywhere because it's yeah. so low budget, etc. Exactly. I've always kind of, you know, kept things that were important to me. And this, I am so glad, you know, I, I started as a, a kid actress, you know, I was uh, doing um, commercials as a kid. And then I actually trained with some wonderful people when I was eight years old and did Hallmark Hall of Fame, Inherit the Wind. And I still have that autograph book, <laughs> you know, wow. the things that I cherished yeah. that made such a difference in my life. Uh, the people I worked with back then were the A-list of actors and uh, they just, you know, George Schaefer, who was the producer and director back then. We're talking 1965. Yeah. So um, I still have things that m meant something to me. Uh, and luckily, I've, I've had enough boxes with that I've <laughs> been able to bring them with me. <laughs> but I tell you, I'm I'm convinced you found the key to the fountain of youth because you haven't changed a bit. Oh, my goodness. God love you, Rita. <laughs> I wish you were closer and I'd give you a big hug and a smooch. Well, you know what I say, don't you? It's uh, it's drinking the fine Crystal Lake wine. It's my fountain of youth. <laughs> yes. yes, That's something I'm going to come on to a little later. You've a fantastic business but going I, there. I do. Thank you. I'm celebrating my 30th wedding anniversary uh, oh, this September. Thank you. And I can't help but think uh, uh, um, good love and, and, and uh, a, a stress-free life. Uh, and I say that because I have no children. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have dogs, but uh, not that I have anything against children. You have yeah. to understand I have 10 nieces and nephews. I just, um, I think I avoided that stress factor. And I think it's, uh, it's allowed me to sort of... Um, I don't know, uh, just move on into my, I'm in my 60s now, do I dare say that? You are now, and, and I surround myself with young people and it keeps me young. That is the key, I believe it. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was the fight scene in the end with Betsy. Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, if if, you're, um, if your listeners ever want to go on my on my webpage, adrianking.com, I actually have the original notes from that scene. When I tell you I threw, you know, took everything, uh, well, Sean Cunningham actually choreographed that scene like a ballet yeah. uh, on the beach. And, uh, oh, my gosh, we started when the, when the sun went down and everything you see there is real. Like I said, there was no holding back. Betsy Palmer, God love her, was the consummate actress and would never pull a punch. And you know what I'm saying? She yeah. was like, she was raised theatrically and, uh, you know, was a big film star in the 40s and 50s. And and she really knew her stuff. And I always say it was playing like playing tennis for me, like, say, with uh, Venus Williams. She totally brought my game up, you know. And when you play with somebody better, you know, if you're going to survive, your game has to be at its peak. And she um, she told me right from the start, uh, um, we had some previous scenes like in the barn and everything where she was kind of, you know, doing the same kind of little little fights. And, and I learned in that scene that, it, that she totally there were no hold, uh, no <laughs> hold bars, you know, no bars hold or whatever the exp uh, expression is. She wouldn't pull back on it. So. I remember we were just down and dirty and gritty and everything you see there. I mean, when she takes my hair and pounds my face into the sand, the reason it's so excruciating is because she really did it. <laughs> oh my God. I, I mean, everybody goes, that looks so real. It's like it was real. <laughs> you oh, know. Wow. By the time we had finished and walked off and limped off, actually limped off, uh, when the sun was rising and all, uh, you know, we were bloody and battered. And uh, and that's when I saw those notes, you know, coffee stains yeah. and all. Sent on a Sean Cunningham, like, grabbed, uh, took the two pages, crumpled them up and threw them in the big 
trash receptacle and I grabbed them and out I went no Sean no you know it's a part of our that was like oh my god we're limping off here off the sand you know and and uh literally you know with uh just sand in my teeth <laughs> Oh, and, listen, and, crazy. and I ha- and I have those notes on anyone who wants to see them. They're on a poster, which Sean encouraged me to make. But they're the once the wonderful thing of the most extraordinary thing about these notes is that there's 13 of them. Oh, wow. And it's not it's not 12. It's not 14. Yeah. He had no he had no clue. And so when I found them, I made him a poster and me a poster just for us called Ballet de Machete. Oh, I love us. <laughs> I love us. <laughs> And it's the only piece of art that he has hanging from Friday the 13th in his office. And I, and he was the one, he said, make some for the fans and they will love you forever. And I am actually getting to my the last of the limited edition and I'm bringing what I have over to London. So anyone who's going to be listening to your show that's coming to the London Comic Con, in two yeah. weeks I'll be there. Can you believe that? Oh, I'm so jealous. I wish it was going. Oh, I wish you were going too. Oh. Um, anyway, I'd love to share that with anybody that's coming there. And uh, and that fight scene was just, uh, I remember it was like it was yesterday. And especially, you know, the swinging of the machete uh, through, um, well, it was actually Tasso with the uh, uh, Tom Savini's assistant um and uh tom savini and the head and oh my god it just you know when i think about how how incredible the experience was uh it it was it was truly like living living it out in real time is the only way i can explain it because it was so surreal you know you're on this dark beach and and you've got one huge light on you and it's like you're wielding a machete and then you know the blood spurts and it it was so real i always say there's no acting it's just purely reacting in a situation like that you know and then of course tom's special effects are just fantastic oh and he's he's just brilliant you know he's his work still holds up i call everything about that movie was the perfect storm between tom savini's special effects that uh, i always say are bloody brilliant (laughs) and and, uh, and then Harry Manfredini's music, oh, yes. which is 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 so big a part of this movie as everything else, because that last scene without him lulling you into that false security and thinking everything's OK, um, the movie wouldn't have that powerful, you know, shocker of an ending um, that everyone to this day remembers where they were and what what they, you know, were wearing or who they were with or what they had for dinner that night, the first time they ever saw that, you know. And like when you were in the boat and Ori Lehman jumps up behind you, like, yeah, you still, you know, sometimes even though you're expecting a jump, you'll still get a fright when he. Oh, yes. When he jumped up and grabbed you, would you still like, oh. Oh, I love to watch it with audiences, you know, and I haven't done that in ages, but I, Betsy Palmer and I, I always, I'll, I'll share this memory. It was, it was so fabulous. Uh, we sat in the back, uh, back of the row of uh, the Chicago Music Box Theater, which was this old theater that they'd restored and it was beautiful. And it, you know, from the twenties with the, the little footlights and then they had stars painted on the, uh, ceiling and it was just beautiful and so Betsy and I were sitting in the back row watching the movie with an audience and we'd never done that in our life if you can yeah. believe it sat together watching it and she had a terrible experience when the movie came out you know they just ripped her to pieces how dare such a brilliant actress do such a horrible role oh. and demean herself and uh, you know they gave out her address and her phone number to write heat mail and oh i mean terrible terrible oh yes oh well it was te- it was a nasty thing i mean i had a very bad stalking situation at the same time and the authorities because there were no stalking laws in this country at that time um it was almost considered like well you know uh, you do a movie like Friday the 13th, what do you expect? That you know, it was sense. like, uh, it was horrible that, uh, when it first came out, the um, the reaction, especially to Betsy, she never quite got over it. And 
it was lovely to see it to sit in the back row and watch the reaction of the fans and it had to have been at least 20 30 years what are we 37 now yeah. probably you know close to 30 years after the movie was made sitting there in the back row watching a so many years later, and she grabbed my leg and tapped me on the leg and said, honey, I guess it was all worth it. Uh, they, she goes, they love us, don't they? Oh, <laughs> by God, they and, and then when the last scene that we, you were just talking about yeah. when uh, Jason comes out of the leg, she, she, she gives me a big jab in, in, the, uh, in the side. She goes, ah! And it still holds up, doesn't it? <laughs> and, you know, and so she and uh, we also, you know, we had other moments after that where I was so happy before she passed. She finally embraced the fact that she was loved for Mrs. Voorhees and that yeah. was OK with her, you know. Yeah, I miss her a lot, Rita. She she was a big part of my life when we reunited back in 2004. Um, needless to say, she didn't know anything about my stalker, and she was really helpful in, uh, as well as the fans were in that 04. Uh, uh, it was a chiller theater, huge, huge uh, uh, convention, and the first big one I'd been to, and the first time I'd ever shared the story when somebody said, why did you disappear from your fans for so long? And, and I finally divulged a little of the story, and there wasn't a... There really wasn't a dry eye in the in the audience, and uh, and it was at that point that I felt that little that little piece of my heart healing, and it was because of you know like yeah. Betsy, you felt like it was all worth it now because you knew that people did care, even though you didn't know there was a piece of your heart that hadn't yeah. healed, you know. Yeah. Um, it, it's that's why I embrace my my fans, who I call my happy campers, because I'm humbled by the fact that I have fans. So it's very hard for me. This I I I love to call my my um, my my peeps my happy campers. Oh, you know? that's lovely. And like the stalker, he he wasn't even following you because of Friday the Thirteenth. Was he? No, yeah. no. That's the joke of it all. He wasn't an obsessed <coughs> fan because of the movie, as it turned out, uh, and it. And it went on and it went off and on for over a year. So I was totally um, a, a total cerebral mess. Um, no, he was, uh, as it turned out, he was obsessed for other reasons. And uh, I'm finally doing a book, Rita. Everybody's been asking me for 12 years. And I'm finally, I finally committed it on to myself. It's going to be a picture book, kind of like with my paintings, that my dark art during the dark years and then full circle of my happy, happy, happy times, you know, and uh, here I am because I find that uh, there's a lot of people that um, hear my story and realize you can come out of the depths of depression and, and horror, uh, in personal horror in your own life. Um, and actually, if you can make it to the next day, you know, to the next year. And uh, finally, there's light at the end of the tunnel if we have, you know, each other's support or at least some support. And, and it turns out that my words are actually inspirational to people and they hang on to them. And Alice is a touchstone for so many kids and so many people that they feel like if Alice, you know, could do it, yeah. if she could make it through, shoot, you know, maybe I could, I can do it too. And uh, and so, who would have thought that all of that uh, come full circle would uh, be meaningful? But it sure, it sure seems to be that way. So I want to share that story with everyone now. Well, I think it's fantastic you're doing that, especially in the age we're in now with social media, and like, exa for example, Christina Lee who played Kyle in Child's Play 2, she right. she gets, cause I'm friends with her on Facebook, and she gets some seriously crazy messages or fans. Oh, oh, I know. I have FBI on speed dial, okay? Oh. This is true. <laughs> I do because um, back it, when I did my first convention, uh, the... Fan, uh, you know, the people that love horror films are not just, you know, I always tell them they're the, the actually the, the probably most 
well-balanced people you're going to find because they get their jollies out as a group or as an individual inside a theater or their own living room. They don't take it to the streets. You know what I'm saying? And and I had an FBI agent uh, from the audience who I had signed a picture for beforehand. Uh, After he heard the story, he gave me his card and he said, you call me anytime. I can't tell you how many other police officers and another FBI person from the West Coast gave me their card, you know, having heard my stories and said, call me anytime. So I do have uh, FBI in my speed dial at any time. I haven't had to use it, except I shouldn't say that. One point in the early 90s, I did have a bizarre situation when we were selling our home in, in on Long Island. But it once again, it, it wasn't so much, I don't think because of the movie, as so much it was just a whack job who saw a picture in the, mm. the, the house. But I digress. I digress. <laughs> I, um, but uh, yes, it's, it's a horrible and very scary thing with social media it's it's very very frightening and uh but at the same time at least you can prove it back in the 80s there were no cell phones uh video cameras were uh hard to come by for you know to to tape i i mean you know it was very hard to prove anything Uh, it was your word against uh, somebody else's word and and so at least you know now uh there are laws thank god and there there's ways to uh hopefully if you're in trouble get someone to you quickly whereas I kind of had to hang out there with other women in the early 80s who uh, were stalked and and hurt I mean physically hurt Mm -hmm. terrible things Teresa Saldana was a very good friend of mine and she was just her face was sliced up and oh oh my my god and and uh nowadays hopefully the authorities can respond quicker and make that uh, you know, Rebecca Schaefer, God bless, rest her soul, was the girl, uh, the actress on My Sister Sam, who was killed by her stalker. And that's why we got her fan stalker. And that's why we have laws because of her death. So, but isn't um, it you know, all, thank God. Isn't it also that so, someone has to It's do, It's so do. incredible that someone actually yeah. had to, you know, die by the hands of a fan for anyone to realize it's serious. You know, but that's what it takes sometimes. God. And when you, when you were stepping out to that first convention you'd done, had you, yeah. were you nervous with all you'd been through? Well, here's what happened. Now, I had done some tiny little shows because uh, back in the day, my therapist said it's good for you to re- you know, re- go and meet your fans. It's, you know, and because I went into voiceovers after the stalker, I actually my my kinship to uh, to the UK is because uh, Rada Royal Academy accepted me with open arms and I studied there uh, and got away from the insanity of New York and Los Angeles because he actually followed me out to LA and then I came back to New York and oh, I was like beside myself and so um, so I I I got lost in London and everyone um, there became so important to me because they were so supportive and it was my home away from home and I still feel that way about it. I have family and friends there and it's it's just friends who feel like uh, they are family to me and and so uh it's it's just a, a wonderful thing and so i went into voiceovers when i came back because uh i had such anxiety still because i i got a soap opera i auditioned screen test got the soap opera uh 1984 called all my children and When I stood in the wings to go on, I started having an anxiety attack and I realized it's still not over. It's still there, even though I thought it was gone. You know, it's uh, amazing what your brain holds on to and buries. And so that's when when I realized with my agent that uh, it's, you know, let's do voiceovers. Let's do looping, which is something I was good at anyway. So for the next uh, 20 years, I made a career, if you look on my website again, doing like some fabulous movies like Titanic and Gilbert Grape and uh, uh, you name it. I did seven seasons on Melrose Place, just looping my voice was, you know, and I kept my I kept wow. my pinky in the business that way because I love yeah. to act. And that was, you know, as close as I could get there and feel comfortable. But 
you ask, and again, I'm looping back to the question about anxiety yeah. and the and the first big show I did in '04. Prior to that, an, a fellow by the name, a writer, a brilliant writer by the name of Peter Brackey, wrote uh, a book called Crystal Memories, and uh, he got everyone, unearthed everyone, including me, uh, to, you know, tell, to, to tell their story. And I had to be convinced that, you know, this was, a, that there was people who actually cared. And uh, he said, you have no idea. Uh, you know, this was before yeah. social media, Rita. So um, big difference, you know, uh, yeah. even though I was in Los Angeles, had no clue there was a fan base for Alice or Adrian King or Friday the 13th, not, you know, I knew the movie was popular because they kept on doing sequels, but I just didn't even think there was more to it than that. And Peter said, you have, you actually have three generations of fans around the world. And he said, you really have to get out there. And so he was the one who convinced me that I would be embraced by the fans and it would uh, because when I spoke about what happened, it, I, it clearly was emotional. It still had, you know, it's it's taken its toll on me. And it took a long time. And he was the one who convinced me that this is going to help. This is going to be part of your therapy. And yeah. he was so right. He was so right. So, of course, I did have major anxiety. I mean, I, I dragged my husband across the country to, you know, be with me. Because, yeah. And now, of course, he, he, he doesn't come because, <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't need to see me uh, loved on by everyone <laughs> for three days. <laughs> but uh, but um, but he was there for me because I was very nervous, you know. But uh, as soon as that first uh, that first convention was over and you tell anybody that was there it was so powerful we re, uh, i mean i remember it so clearly and uh it, it was you know it really made a difference and from that po- moment on i was able to think about perhaps doing on camera again yeah. and all the people that had grown up uh the kids that had grown up on the Friday 13th part one and two that were fans of Alice and were like, why did she get killed in part two? Mm -hmm. Uh, And we have a whole story behind that one too. She's really not dead. She's alive and well, post-traumatic stress dream. You know, the fans love to hear the truth about that because, uh, because they don't want Alice dead. And I convinced them she's alive in the woods and drinking fine wine and painting. Everything's good, (laughs) you know? And uh, so all those kids are now the writers and the directors and the people like yourself that grew up on them and embrace it. And uh, they would, they started sending me scripts and I've done a couple of little wonderful little independent films and tales of Poe is one of them. And uh, I just did a little short uh, with someone who some brilliant filmmakers that are in their twenties that um, filmed it on 16 millimeter, which is what really uh, kind of got me into it. Cause I love the grit of the original se- you know, late seventies, yeah. eighties horror movies. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, anxiety's gone, all gone. Fantastic. Well, I think you're such an inspiration for all you've been through, and you're so positive that'll encourage other people who think there's no light that's, at the end of the tunnel. Yes, and that's what I do try to. Uh, uh, that's the message I try to pass along, Rita. It's it's all about just hanging on. If it's only a thread. Just hang on to that thread because it'll get better tomorrow, you know. And uh, there were some very dark, dark. I mean, some of my art was so bad. My mom threw it down the incinerator in my apartment building. It scared her so badly. Well, I suppose but, um, it was a therapy for you yeah. as well. You're yeah, right. it was my therapy. Yeah. It truly was. And that's why I think when I write my book, um, I'm going to have it with my art side by side because it's it's very expressionist uh of what i was going through you know well that's a and, book i will definitely be looking forward to reading yeah me too it's like it's so hard for me to actually put it into words but i yeah. think there's been enough time that i have to do it now because yeah. uh I just, you know, you see everybody else kind of dropping off and it's like, shoot, man, no one's going to get it right except for me. So I'd better write it down. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> but then uh, right now you have a very successful business with Crystal Lake Wines. So would you like to tell me a bit about that? Well, that is such a blessing from the universe. I call Friday the 13th the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> now that I'm on that side of it, you know. And when we retired, and I, I, I like I said, we, we say that jokingly now, but when my husband and I thought we retired up to Southern Oregon wine country 12 years ago, It'll be 12 years ago this July 21st because it was my birthday. Oh. And, uh, yeah, my 50th birthday, we moved here. And we went to, uh, like, 10 wineries that were in the valley, maybe 12, and picked our favorite consistent winery, which was Valley View Winery. Uh, it happened to be the oldest family-owned and run uh, winery in southern Oregon, the the uh, family that owns it planted the vines in the early 70s. So the dad passed away, but the mom kept it going while the the family grew up and they took it over and they actually planted the fields. And it's one of those fabulous stories. Well, we joined their winery. And so we got to know, and I've always loved wine. I mean, I grew up in a family where there was wine on the table all the time and I'm married into a family who loved fine wines. So I really had, I had a good history of wines, but would you not believe this one, Rita? After two years of going there every three months and picking up our wine selections and talking with the, the winemaker there who'd been there since 1985 and a graduate of UC Davis, which is the Harvard of wine schools and, uh, and the mom and telling them how much we love their wines and pairings. And Michael, who was about 40 at the time, says to me, Adrian, how would you like to join our family? Oh, wow. And I said, that's what I said. <laughs> That's what I I said. Oh wow! <laughs> sure, I'm not sure with the math, but of course, you know. And, yeah. I, and then uh, my husband's stand, standing right next to me, so I know he's not hitting on me, you know. <laughs> and uh, and so I say, what does that mean? He he says, well, we know that you love our wine and. I finally got up the nerve to tell you we love your movies. We're big horror fans. And we would love you to run our tasting room. And that was, oh, my God, nine years ago, maybe. And we, I, you know, I was learning everything I didn't know. And then about six weeks later, I go into his office. And I and I had already run this past Richard, my husband. I said, so do you, do you think the fans would like like their own wines. You think Crystal Lake wines might be something that the fans might be interested in? And he says, I don't know. Ask Michael. So I go in the next day and I said, so Michael, I had this crazy idea. What do you think about a, uh, a private label um, for Crystal Lake wines? And he's, he smiled and he looked at me and he said, gee, I was wondering how long it would take you to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> So he had it in the back of his mind yeah. that the, uh, he, you know, went to UCLA in business and uh, came back and took over the winery. And he was so smart. And uh, and so I said, do you think, it, you think it's going to work? And he said, one way to find out. And so he said, uh, let's create a, uh, a Facebook page called Crystal Lake Wines by Adrian King and see what happens. And, of course, it had his website, the Valley View Winery website, and it blew out their website. Oh so God. fans were so into the idea, so excited that I had to quickly come up with a label, you know? Yeah. And so what I did is I chose my Alice in Canoe, a painting that I'd done of, uh, you know, the famous last scene of when she's hanging over the canoe in the, in yeah. the boat. And uh, we, uh, and so that I created my own, my painting of uh, my own painting of my own act character Alice with my so I have that passion two passions there my third passion wine I mean it was unbelievable and uh those two uh, so the first one was a Chardonnay and a, a Cabernet Sauvignon they sold out immediately uh the third one I came up with I started getting a little more uh 
clever and I came up with uh, a different color canoe, a purple canoe Mm -hmm. and survivors Syrah because I figure, you know, let's have a little play on words, survivors Syrah, which was my uh, go-to one. I always loved those nice spicy wines. So um, then we came up with uh, cabin a Sauvignon because cabin B is almost ready. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so we had Cabernet, Sauvignon, and every year I add a varietal. So we've got Midnight Merlot and they sell out and then the grapes come back and we'll like Camp Blush sold out, but we'll have it back again. I just came out with 13 Riesling, which is a sweeter wine because the fans love sweet wines. Some of them love the big reds, but some of them like the sweeter wines. Yeah. And the hardest thing I had to do was convince people to drink the wines, save the bottles, order more wine. (laughs) Because everybody thought, what a great gimmick. And it wasn't a gimmick. It was the fine wine. And so once people started talking about it and with social media, word of mouth was, hey, got to try Adrian King's you know, Crystal Lake wines, they're a real deal and they're really fabulous. Now, the sad part, Reed, is we can't sell, send them abroad or to out of this continental states because yeah. the shipping is a killer. I mean, yeah. right now the shipping is killer. It's, it's just gone up again. And I try to incorporate the shipping in my bottle prices. I've become a, a, a quite, you know, uh, I'm a very, uh, I very protective of my fans. I want everything to be for, right for them. I, sign every bottle unless you tell me not to i wrap nobody touches my wine orders except for me so we keep it small there's no advertising except for um you know social media facebook and at the conventions i'll hand out my little you know cards and that's about it i'll tease you with bottles and we'll have we'll have a raffle i don't know sometimes i did a live uh, raffle uh, on facebook when i was in indianapolis and it was hysterical um so I have a lot of fun with it, and and my happy campers love it. And uh, I'm coming. I mean, I, I I just it's like I said, the gift that keeps on giving. Well, you know that's so fantastic for the fans as well because they know when they get that bottle of wine, the personal touch you had in packing it and sending it and everything else. Do you know? Ex- yeah, and that's why I I do it because it means something to me that yeah. they. I know it means something to them and they know it. It's it's a mutual love, you know, a, and a mutual respect. And uh, and so if you're going to put out the money for, for, you know, for Crystal Lake Wines, I want to make sure you get the, uh, uh, you know, you really get an impact and you get, uh, when you open your boxes, you smile. And there's always a little treat in there that unexpected. So, oh, you know, whether it's a new, a new 8 by 10 that I've come out with, that's, that's fun or, uh, you know, something uh, around Valentine's Day. I'll do ch- chocolates with the red wines because they're fabulous pairings. Oh. And uh, and then, um, you know, I'm going to bring some labels over uh, to uh, to the UK for some of my fans that asked for them who've been, you know, just, we want your wine, but, you know, we, I know you can't bring bottles. So, uh, but uh, it's just one of those uh, just... I never expected in a million years and it's just joyous. And I have a Crystal Lake wine corner at the winery with my paintings hung up with other paintings of Alice that other brilliant artists have sent me um, or, or a paddle from the, you know, canoe paddle that someone made for me. Um, Other items that people, uh, (laughs) masks that people have made, you know, Jason masks and all sorts of wonderful things. And now uh, it's actually, I had two ladies come from Sweden and drive up from San Francisco, a five hour drive as a Valley View winery, as a destination spot in Jacksonville, Oregon, um, to meet me, get your Friday 13th thing signed and, and get photos signed and wine bottles signed. And they took the wine bottles back with them to Sweden and, I have people from all over the states now making it a road trip. So it's turning into something that I never expected. Isn't it so crazy, the journey life brings you on? Because here you are. Isn't it? 
You're going to that winery just to get your wine, and here you are with this amazing business now. It's crazy. It is absolutely crazy, and I encourage everyone to to realize that you know you might have a dream. You and you you may think you know what you you're going to end up doing or want to end up doing, but don't say no to something that comes up Mm -hmm. because you just never know where it's going to lead you. And, you know, I always said, besides, uh, besides the passion and the persistence and patience, I always, uh, you know, I, I just say, you know, be a little flexible too, you know, just, just, you know, take the blinders off sometimes because, uh, uh, you know, if I'd said no to this guy, you know, no, I'm busy or no, yeah, you know, uh, exactly. I don't want to join your family. That sounds weird, you know, yeah, so true. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you never know where your next uh, journey is going to come from. You really don't. And uh, this is quite the journey and I get to share it with everyone and oh this is my latest venture um that I'll share with you because I I just think I have to do it I want to do a wine pairing show because people want to know what to have with their wine so I want to do a wine pairing show and then if people come by and visit me like say Amy Steele who lives now she visited me from the or uh from LA once. Uh, now, if your guests don't know, uh, listeners don't know who Amy Steele is, she was uh, Ginny in part two of Friday the 13th and in April Fool's Day. And she uh, she came up to visit me at the winery and lo and behold, she just fell in love with the area and moved to Oregon too. Oh, so, wow. uh, you know. <laughs> oh that's all so I'm saying can... is, oh, wow. <laughs> You know, you, well, and that's what, that's what I say too. Oh, yeah. wow. Because it's truly, that's, that's what life can become is an, oh, wow. If you hang in there, you just never know. You know, exactly. it's just crazy. And so I'm thinking about doing this YouTube uh, pairing show, wine pairings, and it's going to be, you know, with the food and then uh, some interesting people who come and visit and you just never know who may, who may show up. up. That's a brilliant so, uh, idea. Isn't that fun? Yeah, people will love that, so they will. I yeah, I know. I didn't even know I had a YouTube channel. (laughs) (laughs) My webmaster set it up for me. I said, "What do you think about this idea?" He goes, "You know, you have a YouTube channel that's out there for six years now. (laughs) You better check it out." (laughs) (laughs) Start putting stuff up. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank God everybody's been doing it for me up to this point, right? So uh, I guess it's time for me to get a little uh, uh, proactive. <laughs> and come here, can I ask you, uh, for anybody who wants to come along and meet you, what dates are you at the Comic-Con over in England? So, yeah, it's, it's there in London, and uh, I will be there arriving a couple of days earlier, hanging out with some friends at the Misty Moon Film Society, who Stuart Morris, if anybody knows Stuart and Jen Morris, they, they have lovely little uh, parties, and they're throwing me a welcome home party. <laughs> so um, uh-huh. I'll be, I'll be uh, there probably Wednesday with them. And Friday, I will be at... Uh, at the convention, I believe, I don't know if this is true, but someone told me it was 9 a.m. <laughs> did conventions start really early yeah, in London? Yeah, they do. They do. They do. They do. People, okay. People so I wanted to get there early because I wanted to catch up on sleep because I am, you know, I'm uh, I'm not really good. We have eight hours between us, as you know. Yeah. And um, so hopefully I'll be good at 9 a.m. If not, I'll be there by 10 <laughs> And it's a full day on Friday, and um, that date is, I will pull it up here, I think it's the 29th, maybe? Let's see, it's the 28th, so I'll be there the 28th on Friday all day, Saturday all day on the 29th, and all day there on the Sunday, too, so, and I fly home early Tuesday morning, so there you go. Excellent. Uh, well, and is this your first be... convention in Europe? Or the UK? This is really, I mean, I was there with Stuart Morris um, uh, he, for something like for a couple of hours one day at something. And I don't even remember what it was because <laughs> it was, I, I mean, when I tell you, all the Bond girls were there, though. I was oh, nice. Imagine me with all the Bond girls. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
And you probably, <laughs> because... you probably look better than most of them do now. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I don't know. The ladies I met were very, very nice. Um, and Stuart represents a couple of them. But um, so he said, come on over. They'll love you. And it was like, uh, it was crazy. It was, I've never seen so many people in my life. And so I have a feeling it's something, uh, the Comic Con is kind of like that. If it's anything like it is here in San Diego in New York, it's just so oh, insane. It is. So, um, yeah. So, uh, I'll, uh, Ooh. I'll be I'll be hopefully um, be standing and you can find me. I'll have my banner up, you know, and uh, the, because I'm worried there's not going to be uh, the only other Friday 13th person there is Robbie Morgan, who was the first girl killed uh, Annie, the cook. So um, her and her husband are going to be there. And his name is Mark Wahlberg and not the Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> you're probably thinking about, but yeah. another one who has a lot of TV shows in this country. So he's coming over he does um uh oh uh what's the name of it we're antique rocha oh, that's yes, what he yes, does yes. Antique rocha. yeah and so he'll be there but i have a feeling i'm just i'm just really hoping up my happy uh, hoping my happy campers show up because it's uh you know comic con and horror fusion but i don't um I don't see a lot of Friday 13 people, so I get a little nervous. I don't ever think that Alice can hold her own, but we'll see. No, you know, Alice can. and Annie. Don't worry. Alice and Annie will be there, and uh, well, I hope we'll I, have, have I, some cool things. I hope you get to come back another time now, so I'll get to come and meet you. Oh, me too. And I'd love to come to Ireland. Uh, you know, I was telling you my grandma was born there. My, uh, he, Maggie Sweeney um, was born in Ireland. Pure and, Irish uh, name, Sweeney. I am actually a first generation American. Um, my mom was born in Liverpool. So I'm, I'm totally plugged into the UK for a lot of reasons. And I need to get and, and meet my Irish friends as well. And came. I, I'd love to. We'd love to come back again and make it uh, make it more of a Friday Thirteenth party, you know. Excellent. And then I get to meet you, Rita. Yes, that's the most important part of the trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is for me right now. <laughs> well, our and I'll sneak you in a bottle of wine. Oh, I yes. have to sneak you in sneak a bottle of Crystal bag. Lake wine. Well, our convention over here is Dublin Comic Con, so you should look into that. They're a great bunch that run that. Yes, and there is a fellow by the name, uh, his last name is King. I think his first name is Mark, but I'm not positive. And so if you're listening, Mr. King, give me a shout out. <laughs> we, well, I think we're Facebook buddies, you know, so oh, nice. maybe I'll meet him in the UK. I mean, in, uh, in London. So, But anyway, I do uh, appreciate your being so tenacious and finally figuring out how we could do this interview. I appreciate that. Uh, really. I've been so delighted to have you on. And just it's before I let wonderful. you go, Adrian, can you just tell people again about your website and where people can keep up with what you're doing? Have your Facebook, Twitter, etc.? Absolutely. So um, best way to get me is you can either, of course, uh, follow me on Adrian King Facebook page, but I do have an Adrian King fan page. And of course, the Crystal Lake Wines by Adrian King. And I'm active on all those pages. Um, then, I mean, it's me personally, nobody handles it for me. So if I don't answer you personally, like the first time, right again, I, you know, eventually I find you. <laughs> But it's hard to keep up. Uh, but I try. And then um, you can get to me on adrianking.com, chrislakewines.com, and they're merged. Um, also, uh, trying to get up to speed on Instagram, trying. I, uh, we're going to connect it up to my Facebook and all that mm -hmm. because I know that's where everybody is these days, all the movers and young shakers, right, on Instagram. <laughs> And uh, let's see, beyond that, uh, come to, you know, if you're in the States, uh, give me an email or give me a, uh, you know, a Facebook hello. If you're planning on coming into Oregon for some reason, I mean, Goonies was filmed on the coast of Oregon. So I'm trying to find out other, other movies were filmed in Oregon too, like River Wild. So what I'm trying to find out is cool places that you could kind of do a, you know, uh, the state is a big state. It's five hours long by drive. So you could actually, and on the coast is so beautiful. It's, it's, it's you know, reminiscent 
reminiscent of how beautiful Ireland is yeah. and uh, and it's green and this you know it's it's beautiful parts of it are green and gorgeous like Ireland and and uh, come visit me at Valley View Winery and visit my Crystal Lake Wine Corner. Excellent. Adrian, an absolute honour to have you on the show. Thanks so much for taking the time. Oh, my pleasure, Rita. And it was really joy, joyous talking to you. You're, you, you are a very happy camper. <laughs> <laughs>